please welcome Mike Volpe, CMO at Cyber Reason, and Justin Howard, founder and CEO of Sprout Social. Do you have a preferred side? We're going to do a little, is... little rearranging here. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. Cool. Wow. Clearly the bar must be closed. Yeah. <laughs> I actually stole that joke from Justin. You literally just told me that two minutes ago. And I was like, that's yeah. a good joke. I'm going to steal it. That's right. We share jokes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is a lot of people for 5 p.m. It is. It's great. Uh, we're pumped to be here. We're going to talk about building a $50 million or $100 million. Actually, it should be $100 million, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the numbers are yeah. a little outdated, although not all of that is, is, is inbound. So there's, yeah. there's yeah, some fudge room it's there. It's fine. But this is marketing, so you exaggerate yeah. a little bit, right? So building a $50 or $100 million inbound revenue business. Uh, I'm Mike Volpe. Um, I've done marketing for a long time, um, probably for this particular presentation. The relevant thing, I was part of the founding team at HubSpot, uh, which obviously had an almost complete inbound model, uh, grew that to $150 million through IPO. And yep. Justin, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, so I'm Justin Howard. I am the CEO and one of the founders at Sprout Social. Uh, we're a Chicago-based uh, SaaS company, and we've been at this for, uh, I think it's coming up on eight years now. Yeah, cool, awesome. And represent non-Silicon Valley SaaS companies. Yeah. Boston, Chicago. There's, there's a few of us, right? Shout out. There's like two people in the back going, yeah, right? <laughs> there we go. You guys are, your guys are with us. Awesome. Cool. It's a 5 p.m. show, so we're going to have some fun with this. All right. So talk a little bit about just like what Sprout Social, so what do you guys sell? And then um, I want to branch into like a whole conversation around who do you sell to? Because yeah. I think that's interesting. Yeah. So um, Sprout, we've, we've got a couple of products. The kind of the flagship or the core product is social media management software. Uh, we work with uh, about 21,000 uh, brands around the world who use it to more effectively manage their social, create strong relationships with their customers. Um, we also have uh, an employee uh, advocacy and engagement product also in the, in the social space uh, and uh, recently made an acquisition in the uh, social analytics and listening. So we've got a few products, the, the, the flagship of which is this social media management. Uh, got Sprout got it. So 21,000 customers, you sell the small businesses? So, uh, yes. Uh, you sell the big businesses? We do. You sell the enterprise? Yes. You sell the Fortune 100? We do. What the hell, man? Yeah, so, yeah. Like, that's like against all like, traditional advice about SaaS. Like, pick a core tar tar target market and, like, go out. Like, what's, yeah. where's that coming from? So, um, not something that we intentionally set out to do, I, I, I don't think. The, you know, the, the idea early on was let's, let's build really great software. And uh, myself and, and a couple other folks on the early team, we came out of the enterprise space. We knew some things that we didn't necessarily like about that. Um, we, we, we felt that we could uh, uh, build great products, find efficiencies in how we sell and market, um, and, it, and, and, it, and it worked. And, and over time, we started to realize that, hey, you know what, our customer base is really diverse. Um, we've got large enterprise, we've got SMB, we've got agencies, we've got, we've got mid-market and everything in between. And, um, you know, again, not intentional, but uh, when you come to that realization and you've got a, ch a choice to make, where do we want to focus, right? Because everyone suggests you've, you've got to pick a niche, you've got to pick your focus, is, is it SMB or you enterprise? Um, and we kind of resisted that idea and said, you know what, these, these segments are all really interesting to us for, for different reasons. Um, and if we can add value to all of them um, and do it profitably as a company, um, then let's, let's kind of take on that challenge. And so uh, uh, all of those, those parts of our business are, are growing, thriving, and, imp and very important to us. So tell us about the inbound side of it. So you've got, you know, you, you sell the businesses of almost any size. Uh, obviously, you've got a set of use cases around the product for that. But where, like, where do the leads come from? Tell, is it different in the enterprise? Do you actually have like an SDR team doing outbound for the Fortune 100? Yeah. Or where, where is all this coming from? Yeah, so it's, it's evolved a bit over time. Um, I'll say on the whole, uh, you know, probably the first six years of our life, the, the vast majority, if not all, of our revenue was inbound. Um, and when we say inbound in our world, that means uh, through our free trial funnel. We have a 30-day free trial of our product. Um, and to a le lesser degree, uh, people who are requesting more information, requesting a demo, that sort of thing. Um, we do a lot of content marketing as well, all with the kind of end destination of one of those two entry points into the funnel. Um, and we, uh, the free trial, obviously, uh, uh, slightly different from a qualification perspective, so we handle those a little bit differently than we do the others. Um, and so that's been kind of our whole lives. That's, that's been the focus. Now, over the last 18 months, We've put uh, a lot more energy into the outbound side of things. We've also grown uh, the, uh, 
the SDR and BDR teams, both the ones doing the outbound uh, prospecting as well as the ones who are qualifying some of the stuff that we get from the, the less qualified channels from an inbound perspective. Yeah. Um, and once those are qualified, they go to the sales organization. The sales organizations work with, uh, work with those folks and, and ideally turn them into customers. So uh, I want to stick to the inbound stuff because that you know got you guys to 50, 80, whatever million ARR, like a huge number. Yep. Um, it, you, so you said some interesting stuff in there. So I heard I heard free trial. Yep. Give us a sense of the volume of free trials yeah. on a monthly basis. Yeah. So we do. Um, I'd say about nine to ten thousand um, businesses uh, are trying our software on a monthly basis. Okay. And then um, that's a lot. Um, yeah. Sounds pretty cool. Yeah. It's, so. It's fun. Uh, but then you also mentioned sales reps. I feel like the typical free trial is like, oh, people try it and then they kind of like humanlessly like upgrade. Yeah, yeah. So, but I heard sales reps. So what, yeah, what's yeah. that mean? What's going on with and that? And that's actually a really interesting and, and um, I think critical point in this. So uh, from the beginning, um, we assigned sales reps to that free trial process. Hmm. And um, certainly we have buyers who uh, avoid the emails, avoid the phone calls, put their credit card at the end and buy. Um, that shifted over time. We've got more affected getting engaged with, with the prospects during that trial. But throughout that trial, uh, we've got live sales reps working on those accounts, making sure that uh, the customer's questions are being answered, that they understand the positioning, the value, and things like that. So uh, the vast majority of those trials get a sales rep, including the SMB segment. Wow. Um, and so we're working with them through that to make sure they get everything that they need out of the trial. And give us a sense of from the SMB through to the enterprise, like what's the variation in like ACV? Yeah, so I'd say the ACV, um, uh, taking out kind of the outliers is probably like a three to four X um, from the, the SMB in aggregate. You know, we, we, we have customers who are paying us less than $100 a month. We have customers that are paying us tens of thousands. Um, but on the whole, um, with, with a couple thousand enterprises, I think it's probably about three or four X. Got it, okay, okay. And then, so, but the rep, it sounds like the reps are actually talking to almost all the trialers. They are. It sounds like there's a few human lists that come through, but really it's kind of a free trial to all inside, inside sales rep, yep. basically. Okay. Yep. Free, and, free trial to inside sales rep model. That's interesting. So are the reps like product experts? Because I think what's interesting, so at HubSpot, 90% of the deals we closed were through the inside sales team and sourced from marketing leads. Yep. But 85% of our leads were inbounds, but based on content, not free trials, yep. right? This is through like IPO. Yeah. So it, it's, it would seem to me like the stuff that we had to do to get the reps, you know, someone downloads uh, an ebook about XYZ topic to get from that to buying a software product is sort of one motion, but it feels like you've got them at the point that like they at least signed up for free trial. Maybe yep. they didn't click around at all in it, but at least they signed up for free yeah, trial. Yeah. And then you're sending it to a rep. Yeah. yeah. So like, what's the rep onboarding? Like, what, what are the reps like? What's the, what's the special sauce there? Um, so uh, it, it, it varies a little bit by segment, but I, I, I think the, you know, the, the primary job of the reps uh, during that process is to demonstrate the value of the product. So to your question, are they product experts? Absolutely. Um, and we, we have this interesting um, situation where because that's our primary source of leads that we point everyone to sign up for this free trial. We get some people who are in there to actually test out the software. We get other people that are in there because we, we told them that that's where they needed to go. But in reality, they want someone to show them around, answer questions, et cetera. So they're not actually there to try the software. They're I there see. to be shown the software. They want someone uh, to do the trial for them. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And uh, so, and it took us a while to kind of figure that out and, and kind of adjust the sales process. But but their, their job there is to, um, and, there's a bit of a disadvantage to that too. So we have the advantage of they're highly qualified by the time we get them. Yes. They've expressed interest enough to, to give us their information, connect their Twitter and Facebook accounts, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's great. But it's also challenging now too, we have to back them off of that. Let's not just talk about the product. Let's, let's talk about what you're trying to accomplish. Let's talk about the typical discovery type discussions that you'd have because they've already oh, been exposed to the Okay, because you're like in feature functionality land because yep. it's a trial-based conversation. Yeah. You're not necessarily in business value land because they've started clicking around on a bunch of buttons. Exactly. And say, oh, why is this in this part of the menu or whatever? Exactly. That's interesting. Yep. So how do, you, how do you branch back to that business value? Because I feel like, so with HubSpot, someone downloaded a piece of content about generating more leads through social media. You can have a business conversation with them and then the, the sort of bridge we needed to build was, okay, well, here's some software that helps you do that better, Yeah. right? You're sort of saying like, well, I have the software, but let's kind of bridge back to the 
higher level business value so we can yep. establish kind of a use case here. Yeah. yeah. How do you do that? So I, I would say for a good chunk of our, of our prospects, um, there's some pain with an existing tool, whether it's through native platforms, a competitor of ours, et cetera. Um, and that's usually where it starts, right? Got is it. I'm, uh, uh, this, this product doesn't do X and I need to do X. Well, why do you need to do X? What is it that you're trying to kind of accomplish? Right, right. Um, at the lower end of the market, certainly there's more folks who are just kind of dipping in their toes and figuring out, and, and that's where we have to do the education and talk about, well, are you trying to get more customers, keep more customers, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so we can kind of use what they focus on in the product to kind of figure out and then ask questions backwards to get to the business value. Okay. Now, um, it seems like, so the product generates all these free trials. You've got the sales team kind of bridging back to business value. Then you've got people sort of, you know, through that process, signing up, becoming customers. Um, in all of our sort of getting to know each other over the past while, um, one of the things that we talked about once that I was fascinated by was the the conversion tribe. Yeah. How do I join such a tribe? It sounds yeah, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. What do they do? Yeah, it's um, so uh, our product and engineering organizations were were set up in, in kind of a hybrid Spotify model, model which is is uh, squads and then squads squads put together into tribes. Yep. Um, the conversion tribe is one of the newest uh, uh, product and engineering organizations that we put together that's focused entirely around. Uh, funnel conversion, first use, and uh, onboarding customers. Funnel conversion, okay, so visitor to the site to signing up, okay, yep. to signing up for the trial. Yep. First use, meaning they've signed up for the trial and now doing something in the trial. Yep. Okay, and then what was the other part? A and then uh, just onboarding, making sure that they okay. seeing value across the product, wherever they might need to see okay. that value. Okay. And so prior to that, we had each of the teams that was working on a different part of the product was yeah. asked to be thinking about that, right? Think right. about what the first use of this feature, or whatever it might be. Right. And um, you know, we did an okay job with that, but when we started putting a team that was responsible for nothing but that and making sure that that onboarding and first yeah. use was incredible, um, that's when we started seeing really good results. And who, who's in that tribe? Because I think that that model is typically, it's like only you know, product manager and some developers kind yeah. of a thing. But I, when we were talking about it, it seemed like, I don't know if they were formally in there or like heavily aligned with them, but you had like, marketing and like some other people in there yeah. as well. Yeah, so the, the growth tribe's interesting because it really straddles uh, marketing and product. And we've got uh, uh, people on the team from both disciplines and also stakeholders from both disciplines. Right. So that really is an interesting um, and something that uh, uh, the executive team is involved with too. So they have kind of like this hybrid mission um, that is obviously for, for a company like ours when it's when it's driven on free trials and, and um, that early exposure to the application, it's critical and took us probably a lot longer than it should have to put that function into place. Yeah, interesting, okay, cool. So now um, I wanna jump ahead a little bit. So um, if we were to graph your ACV across the whole business from you know year one, two, whatever, kind of yeah. post product market fit through to today approaching 100 million ARR, what, what, what are the like, yeah. Tell, tell me when I when so, I when do I stop? Like so, what's a, so your one like, and two is like this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's and then flat. ever since then it's it's, it's it, okay. Yeah. It's and what and so and what and what how like how much of a change overall? Like from a couple thousand dollar ACV to five thousand yeah. or ten twenty like. No, I I mean the uh, so when we first started out we were in a in a category where our competitors were free products. And Free and then had a, a few dollar a month plan was like the, I feel like the typical yeah, kind of company Yeah, yeah, so that people were just nameless. getting used yeah. to Twitter, just getting used to Facebook. There were free tools out there like TweetDeck and Seismic and Hootsuite and these. Yep, yep. Um, and so when we came out, we started pricing really low. So I would say our ACB back then was probably maybe like 200 bucks. So $200 a year. Yeah. Right, yeah. 10, 20 bucks a month. We priced wow. it incredibly low. Wow. Um, which uh, haunts us still. How does um, it haunt you still? <laughs> So, don't you get a lot of customers if you have low prices? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 um it's interesting because at some point your product's gonna gonna outpace your your pricing, uh, uh, in virtually every scenario. I've never talked to a founder who said we we price too high, right? It's always that we we kind of started yeah. too low as the product gets more mature, and and also the market. They said, you know what? Uh, social is a critical part of our business. It's mission critical across the organization. We're gonna take this seriously. We need world class tools. Yeah. And so. Um, we were anchoring the market that this was not a really valuable tool initially, and, and the reality it was. Yeah. Um, and so over time, we've gradually kind of stepped that up. We've cut off the bottom of our, uh, of our pricing tiers and, and kind of fixed that. 
but we still find So you've cut off the bottom, actually. So it's not just you've gone, like, raised prices and added functionality and sort of, like, grown up, but you've also chopped off the bottom. We have. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And so and now we haven't imposed that on any existing customers. We've never forced an increase. Cool. But you can't sign up for those lower level. I can no longer get it for nine bucks a month. You can't. Okay. You might be able to. I might. Well, me. I might right, I mean, I'm special, but yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah. So that's so that's interesting, and I feel so. It's, and the point you made about people equating price to value yeah. is fascinating. It's like when you go into a wine store and you buy a bottle of wine, you're like, ah, oh, you know going to see my buddy Justin, he's really cool, like, I gotta buy a $30 bottle of wine, right? Yeah. I would never buy you a $9 bottle of wine. Thank you. When in reality, like, you know, if you tasted those, there may not be a difference, yeah. or maybe the $9 one is actually even better, yep. right? Yep. But it's like that equating price to value. We saw that in like, during the product market fit sort of phase of HubSpot, I remember pitching my other sort of head of marketing friends, and you'd go through this whole pitch, and why it was awesome, and all the things were really great, great product, here's why you should use it, the vision of inbound, and all these things. And then they'd be like, okay, like how much is it? And we'd be like, it's $250 a month. And they would kind of look and be like, well, like what's wrong with it? Yeah. Right? Because they were yeah. expecting like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 a month. They were expecting these really, really big high prices. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's funny because if you talk to a really small business that wasn't venture back, didn't have a VP of marketing, and they were like, oh, 250 a month. Like, oh, geez, I don't know. It's so expensive. Like, what are we going to do? Yeah. It's just that mindset of those different buyers, like a 10-person company versus a 30-person company, there can be, like, vastly different sort of price elasticity. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys found the same thing, and you've just been, like, chopping off the bottom, adding at the top yeah. to drive that ACV up over time. We have, and, and even still, right, so I, I think um, even our, our lower-end customers now, they convert more at the, at the higher-dollar plans. They're seeing the value. Oh. And, and that's something that we watch to give us indicators on, on how we're priced. But even still, if you think about, we've got small businesses, we've got large enterprise, um, there is a portion of our customers where we're priced well, and there is a portion of our customer base where we're still way underpriced. Yeah, so who are you way underpriced for? Way underpriced for, so I'm gonna say enterprise generally, but the reality is it doesn't have as much to do with the business size as the sophistication of their needs. Okay. Right. So there are companies that might fall into SMB or mid market, depending on your uh, on the way that you categorize them, that have really sophisticated needs of our product, um, and uh, we're underpriced. And and we would get into situations where we'll go head to head in these bake offs with with solutions that are half a million bucks. We'd come out the other end winning. Yeah. Uh, and then they look at the pricing and say, you know, this this the the, the, the buyer would get spooked or whatever yeah. would happen. Um, and so we've we've made strides against that. It's something that we're still kind of dealing with. It's, it's also hard in those situations because the company that's charging half a million bucks can afford to have a sales rep that's taking the chief whoever officer out to golf yep. and stakes at Morton's and all that stuff, right? Yep. Because they're going to get $500,000 at the end of the deal. Yeah. You've got an inside team that, you know, can send them a picture of a steak yeah, on yeah, Instagram yeah. or something, right? It's like a, yeah. there's a different, you know, thing going on there and a lot of, like the, and it's, it's, it's like, Matching your pricing to sort of the buying process of some of those companies yeah. is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm now so I'm at Cyber Reason now. Our average deal size is like twenty five times higher than HubSpot's. Yep. We've got field sales reps, there's steak dinners, there's golf, there's all that crazy stuff. Yeah. But then at the end it spits out deals that are, you know, six to seven figures. Yep. And so like you can afford it, but it's definitely like a totally different world. Yeah. Um so it, it, and you're right, it's kind of it's almost like you're like, we won the bake off, we're priced way less. <laughs> Like, what is the problem? Yeah. And some buyers just get spooked by it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Interesting. Um, okay, so with that rise in ACV, I feel like the other kind of um, topic we should definitely dive into and spend some time on that is like the big knock on anyone who goes into SMB, right, is uh, churn. Yeah. Right? And like, oh, the SMB, like, you know, you'll never make it work. The churn is too high. They all go out of business. They cancel. It's like so hard. Yep. Um, but... You guys have crushed it there. Yeah. So, like, what's the what's the secret? How do you conquer churn? So, um, you know, when we think about churn, and 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 this is true for any segment, but um, we'll we'll kind of start with the SMB. And and naturally, uh, most of our churn comes from the SMB segment, um, as you would expect for for natural reasons. Meaning, um, meaning, so because so, the smaller companies have higher logo churn. Correct. Okay. And, and and actually, in aggregate, they tend to have higher revenue churn as well. Okay. Um, there's just more of them that, uh, and in our case, a lot of times it's they're um, not committed to the problem, right? Yep. Um, they're trying some tools, but they're not committed. Yep. Or you have the normal reasons they go out of business, et cetera, whatever it might be. Um, but the thing that we focus on um, related to churn, and, and this 
this was really important in starting to get our CAC and LTV right so that we knew what we could invest in these segments yeah. was not chasing the logo churn problem, but focusing on growing the existing accounts. And so that way you could net out that churn, you could have a healthy segment. And the, the idea behind that is, assuming that you've got good customer service, um, if, if, if you cross that off the list and then you're still not a good fit for someone, whether it's their own reasons or your reasons, that's an incredibly expensive and distracting problem to solve. Yeah. I would rather spend that time and energy on the people who we're a great fit for and growing those accounts and adding users or upselling or whatever it is. And so when we think about churn internally, that's, that's our focus is let's focus on the people that we're a great fit for, not cry over the ones that. Yeah, this, that this is fascinating. We were talking about this. It was like twins separated at birth or something yeah. because you're, probably five or so, five, six into HubSpot, we sort of, we've been just beating our head against the whole churn issue, mostly tackling it as a logo churn issue. Yep. And I think, um, and I'm, it's been 20 years since I took an economics class, but there was this thing I believe called the Laffer Curve, and the idea was that there was sort of like a, a natural rate of unemployment, yeah. and it's like hard to ever get unemployment below like 4%. And I think there's also a natural rate of logo churn. Yeah. And for SMB, it's probably one and a half, one, one and a half percent per month. I don't know what you would think yeah. your opinion of that would be. In the enterprise, it's less, yeah. right? But there is a natural rate of logo churn depending who you're selling to. Yep. And you can literally waste time trying to get below that natural rate. Like trying yeah. to get out of employment below 4% is kind of a fool's yeah. errand. Even knocking off a tenth of a percent in that segment super hard. is incredibly so hard. expensive, incredibly yeah. hard. And so what? So within like the SMB, like, your opinion on sort of what is that natural rate of churn? Because I'm sure everyone's like about to write down like, don't go past this number. Yeah, I, I think um, now this depends on your growth, right? If, if all your existing customers are flat, I think you probably can't go beyond maybe a point and a half. Uh, if you've got some, some decent growth within that segment for your existing customers and you know that they're gonna increase in value over time. I, I just mean logo churn, so not, not the net revenue churn. Yeah. So just the logo churn, you'd say one and a half percent. Uh, I agree. Yeah, well, could even be a I little higher the if the businesses are smaller. I wouldn't even argue. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think if and, and I think they're related though, because if 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 my existing accounts aren't growing, I don't want my logo churn to go much over a, a point and a half. But I'll take two and a half percent logo churn if my existing accounts yeah. are going to grow at forty percent, because it'll it'll net out well. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, the goal is always to have the net revenue retention be hundred percent or higher. Yep. Right. But your point is, you can even allow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Totally agree. And so the interesting thing, so what helps about that led to us to make a bunch of changes in how the product was priced as effectively and to add like some add-ons and things like that over time. Yeah. Um, and it was all that upselling, that sort of insight that you just had of like focusing on the customers that actually already liked you and could you just get them to spend a little bit more. Yep. And if you look like leading up to IPO, it was like net revenue retention, if I remember right, was sort of like 78%, 86%, like 93%. And then post IPO, call it, I think it was like four to five quarters later, went over 100%, Yep. right? Yep. And I feel like you guys have, without revealing your exact numbers in this stuff, have sort of seen the kind of same type of progression yep. as you figured out how to get the base to upgrade more, like yep. get happy customers to yep. spend more. With and, and, and it all came down to what we're talking about, which is stop focusing on the logo churn, focus on your existing account growth. Yeah, and then I, think, I think that's a really big insight that I think a lot of people sort of miss. It's like there's, once you start to get to scale, like product market fit and sort of finding the scalable model, those stages of the business are different. But once you start to scale, like don't overemphasize yep. the, the focus on, on lower logo churn, yeah. yeah. Um, it, unless it's really bad. Right, and then yeah, and well, then probably fix it. But. Well, then I mean, then yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. you're just fucked. So yeah, yeah, well, you know, like you don't have a business, so that's different. Um, okay, so <laughs> speaking of dropping f bombs, we have a question um, that you you said you should ask this. Um, so what have you fucked up? Yeah, uh, so we've covered a couple of them already. Um, the uh, uh, pricing um, yeah. early on. I, I mean, think, the quote here is pricing too low. We've increased pricing five to six times, and it's now. It's still too low. Too low. Yeah. Um, and, you know, every scenario is different, so maybe take that with a grain of salt. But in, in our space anyway, um, it's, it's just been the reality. And we test and we test. And, and we find, you know, an interesting insight is, and, and the cool thing about 10,000 trials a month is you can test a whole bunch of stuff. Right, and get yeah. just a ton of data, yeah. um, which, which not everyone has that luxury. But the thing that we found is even the smallest businesses, 
the higher value plan that they signed up for, the more likely they were to spend more later, which is kind of counterintuitive. So l let's huh. say I'll just use fake numbers, but the person who signed up for the $100 plan, even uh, a 10 person business, yeah. uh, was less likely to grow with us than if they signed up for a $300 plan, they were more likely to increase that spend. And um, so, you know, just through a lot of learnings, we've, we've tried to chip away at that problem. So, so pricing is one. Um, I think that uh, uh, not focus, when you're, when you're working on inbound, in SaaS in general, right, you're focused on CAC to LTV, and I think early on, um, we, we took a look at our numbers and we said, yeah, those are pretty good, let's just keep growing, keep investing, et cetera, without taking the time to, to dig in and figure out what was actually in those numbers. Yeah, this is the right. other thing we were talking about too, how yeah. like the averages of all these metrics across your whole business, yeah. they're like evil because they hide all the interesting information. Yeah, and it's Like the average time, is not your friend at all. So talk more about that. Yeah, so if you think about, you know, like early on we looked at, okay, what's our, what's our, uh, our, our blended uh, cost of acquisition? Or what is the, the LTV to CAC for this particular channel or something like that? And we focused on kind of those high level things and we said, okay, you know, we're kind of happy with those numbers, but uh, without peeling back the onion a little bit further, you don't find the opportunities to actually optimize that. Yeah. When you dig in and you say, okay, you know, this channel uh, on the whole is successful, but half of it's completely wasted. Um, and then you click in a little bit further and you find out, okay, in this region or, or to this landing page, et cetera. And just getting too kind of, of cocky about the metrics that we had early on shielded these opportunities for growth and every time we uncover one of those, and we still uncover them today, we kick ourselves because we're saying, should we, we could have figured that out six years ago. Think about where we'd yeah. be um, because we weren't uh, kind of being real with the data. And I, I think in some ways it's scary, right? If you're saying, well, we're getting two to one payback or three to one payback, you know, let's not, let's not uh, uh, punch the gift horse. But the, the reality is every opportunity to grow and get better is in those next five, six, seven layers of data. Yeah, yeah, that, that four to one LTV to CAC hides that part of your business is eight to one, yeah. and part of your business is one and a half to one, Yep. right? Like, and you really need to drill in to understand what those different segments are, um, and, and yeah, it, there can be so many insights there. At one point, we sort of got to the point in HubSpot that we started to do that kind of analysis, and what we realized was that all of the, almost all the companies with fewer than 10 employees were actually like pretty bad economics for us, Yeah. right? And that leads you to like, okay, well, there's pricing changes we can make, there's you know, lead scoring changes and allocation to sales reps changes we can make, there's you know, um, pointing sales reps in the right direction, there's changes to the pitch and the messaging, there's changes to what type of lead generation you're doing. There's a million changes you can make throughout the entire business to kind of shift it to where your payback ratios are much better. Yeah, right? and it's, it's um, you know, you justify it to yourselves early on and I think probably a lot of people have found themselves in this position by, well, it's, it's market share. Like, okay, this customer might not be profitable, this one is blended, we look good, let's yeah. just get a bunch of logos. Yeah. Um, and the problem with that is that, uh, again, you're masking your opportunities, but you're also building bad habits, you're, you're asking the sales team to work on, on leads and, and prospects that aren't as valuable, your churn numbers are, are artificial, and it, you're just, you're not dealing with a real business yet. Yeah. Not dealing with a real business yet. Yeah. The thing we don't worry about. Cool. All right. So any parting advice? Is there one, we had a bunch of things here we we're going to dive into. I think we're close on time. Like, what do you want to, what, what's the one word of wisdom you would leave these folks with? Um, one word in one minute. Um, <laughs> so uh, segmentation. Um, is, and, and I mean this in every sense, in understanding what the, um, uh, what the productivity at the rep level is per lead, what the, the um, in your ad campaigns, figuring out which, which keywords are performing well and, and, and click down five more times. Yeah, your point, like we earlier we were talking about how at a, at a specific AdWords campaign or a campaign group or something like that, might look like it's performing really well, yeah. but within there, there's 10 keywords, yeah, yeah. eight of which are great and two that suck. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll just and close same with thing it. for like individual sales reps, like a sales team, like a sales manager might look great, yep. but four of the reps are good and one is really bad, yep. or you know, within each segment of customers or each vertical industry, it's like keep clicking in and find those, you know, the sweet spots and the not so sweet spots in the business and continue to morph it over time. Yep. And, and find those signals that, that are hidden in that kind of good looking yeah. line 
there's some bad stuff in there. And, and just to, to, to close with an example, um, you know, we, we had a period where we cut our ad spend by probably 60 or 70 percent. Wow. And the next month increased the yield from that by maybe 30 percent. Wow. Um, just because we, we got real and said, let's put our energy elsewhere. And yeah. so segmentation, th the, the awesome thing about SaaS is there's plenty of art involved, but there's math and science, can't lie. Yeah. Um, and if you get really good about getting intimate with your data, like all the answers are in there. So. All right, apparently you just that. gotta get intimate with the data. Yeah. And that's where we're gonna leave really you. Really intimate 530. with the data. Everyone, Justin Howard, yeah, founder and CEO of Sprout Social.